Hi everyone. In the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about my thoughts on How to Do Nothing by Ginny O'Dell, Resisting the Attention Economy. I've read chapters one and two in the introduction. I got this book from Pagination Bookshop when they posted it on their social media. And, just, you know, several of my friends and different circles um, are thinking about putting together a book club, virtual book clubs on various books. And uh, this is one of them that we've been talking about. I'm really excited to read it. I've been luxuriating in just the low production quality of Facebook Live and all the content people have been uploading. And this is very much in that tradition. I've made this recording on a Chromebook with free software and it's not edited very much at all. So anyway, um, without further ado, I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Right away, I knew that this book was right up my alley um, because, you know, it's about trying to use community and using the act of unplugging to solve the world's problems. Um, and it's also my right in line with my preferred light, writing style, which is basically just stringing a bunch of citations together and interspersing in, in your own insight. Um, reading through the chapters, you can kind of see the outline underneath it. Um, I made notes of basically the the themes of each page as I was flipping through. And it goes from the Redwoods to the Ghost Ship Fire to the book Cannery Row to Labyrinths, which are one of my favorite things, to Bird Watching to the book Wanderlust to John Muir. And then chapter two goes from Burning Man to Epicurus to Hippie Communes to B.F. Skinner to Westworld to Thomas Merton. And so if you are a person who likes um, reading a book that stitches together a bunch of wide ranging ideas and, and topics, and this is um, your cup of tea, it's, it's certainly mine anyway. Um, something else I noticed is that the author talks a lot about one of my favorite topics, which is how to become a better listener. I teach, um, a class at Missouri state called effective listening come 326. And, you know, in that class, we talk a lot about mm, the way technology is changing the way people interact. And, but we also talk a little bit about attention in that class. And in this book, the author talks about attention a lot. I mean, I, I was already aware that attention is something that creates our reality because with, with listening or with just with moving through the world in general, there's a selection process, you know, there, there's too much stimuli uh, going on at any one point in time to ever possibly process all of it. So we select certain parts to focus on or to listen to, or to give our attention to. And the things that we don't select, they don't register and they may as well not exist for us. The way that it's put in, in this book you know, sounds like this. Um, talks, she talks about patterns of attention. What we choose to notice and what we don't are how we render reality for ourselves. And thus ha they have a direct bearing on what we feel is possible at any given time. Um, so again, the title of the book is How to Do Nothing. And so right away, the question comes up, what is meant by nothing? It's obvious that she's not just talking about, oh, we should sit still 100% of the time because it's a very life-affirming book and just sitting around doesn't um, qualify as experiencing life. Uh, in the book, she says the first half of the book, I'm sorry, the first half of doing nothing is about disengaging from the attention economy and the other half is about re-engaging with something else. And that, that something else she wants us to re-engage with is time and space, nothing less than time and space. And I love this quote. Um, it means embracing and trying to inhabit somewhat fuzzier and blobbier ideas of maintenance as productivity, of the importance of nonverbal communication, and of the, the mere experience of life as the highest goal. And that is beautiful. The mere experience of life as the highest goal. And so um, the 
obviously if, if the mere experience of life is the highest goal, then sitting around doing nothing, uh, is not what is being talked about because you're not experiencing life if you're just sitting around. So uh, paradoxically, there's a way to quote unquote, do nothing that still involves living a full life. And this author would argue a fuller life than the model presented to us by technology platforms like the inter- uh, like Facebook. So the, I think the organization of the book is going to be threefold. She's going to examine, uh, and then this is a quote, dropping out, not dissimilar from the dropping out of the 1960s, and then a lateral movement outward to things and people that are around us, and then third and finally a movement downward into place. So the book has six chapters, and the first part is, uh, um, so far what I've read about, mainly is about um, the dropping out part, um, where she gives a kind of like a historical overview of the communes of the 60s and 70s. This is on page 38. And she talked about the ahistorical nature of what they were trying to do. People, uh, the original hippies, many of them weren't familiar with the, you know, history of the utopian movements prior to them. They were just protesting as authentically as they could in the only way that they could see that was possible. The general outline of a commune, she writes, was to put together some bread, buy a piece of land, make the land free, and start rebuilding the economic, social, and spiritual structures uh, of man from the bottom up. However, most of the people who were doing that didn't have any idea that that's what they were doing. They just thought they were dropping out. Um, And so we know that most of the communes that have ever existed didn't make it because they they were unsustainable. Because it turns out it takes a lot of expertise to, to build those structures that are needed in the absence of, you know, the existing societal ones. Um, and the, the author talks about the reasons why the u- u- utopias never managed to exist in an idealized sense for any length of time. And the reason is there are people who live in them and people, um, are just people. They, they cannot be optimized. They reserve the right to play along or not, um, They don't like to follow someone else's plan. And so anyway, that was a good overview of um, communes, hippie communes. I'm looking forward to the next two parts of the book, which I think will come later, talking about the lateral movement outward to the things and people around us and the movement downward into place. I think she's going to kind of talk about like, I wouldn't be surprised if it's it's about like homesteading and back to the land, back to the land type stuff. But um, as far as unplugging, there's a lot of material in the first, uh, in the introduction and in the first couple of chapters that um, Odell uh, discusses just kind of like digital detox stuff, which was interesting. And she's really picks a bone with, the like obsession with productivity that so many of us have in our, in our workplaces. And it kind of made me think about like mental health days that people have at work, which I mean, kind of sounds like a humane policy on the face of it, but it never asks the deep deeper question. Why is our work so hellish that we need mental health days just to continue uh, sustaining our life? going to work every day, you know, it'd be like, um, if I had a job, like instead of mental health days, imagine it was a physical health day. You know, if I had a job where my, my job was to take a hammer and pound away at my extremities, my arms and legs, um, you know, how kind it would be of such an employer to let me take a physical health day every now and then. Um, so the author on page 22 says um, she talks about self-care in the activist sense that um, Audrey Lord meant in the 1980s when she said that caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. Um, so, you know, the author Jenny O'Dell is a artist. She's been like an artist in residence at, like half a dozen places from what I could tell. 
and also a teacher, studio art teacher. And so she was had had some inter- interesting stuff to say about how the nothing that she's talking about doing is only nothing from the capitalist point of view, where it's like not immediately monetizable. Just just talking about free time for self directed thought, and um, you know, doing what one will. Here's another good quote. Um, Overemphasis on performance turns what was once a dense and thriving landscape of individual and communal thought into a Monsanto farm whose production slowly destroys the soil until nothing more can grow. As it extinguishes one species of thought after another, it hastens the erosion of attention. So then we're back to attention. And evoking the word Monsanto as a devil word reminds me, I looked I looked on Amazon at some of the uh, the zero star reviews or one star reviews, and um, let's see if I can find it again. One of them said the book was nothing, but here it is: liberal cod swallop. Um, and so I think you know every once in a while she mentions stuff like that and talks about Trump, uh, and so I think a lot of the, the low ratings um, were turned off by the politics. But back to back to attention and this sort of overemphasis on performance and kind of just also sticking with the agricultural references. Um, she had an image here that really stuck out to me: monocultures of the self. She she's basically drawing an analogy between the economy's effect on the ecosystem and the attention economy's effect on attention. She says in both cases they produce monocultures where those components that are seen as not useful are like the first to go. (sighs) One thing I'm interested to see as the book goes on is she talks about trying to, to let herself grow into shapes that don't fit easily into the monetizable clickbait sort of mode. And I'm interested to see what shapes those are. She says, um, I'm suggesting that we protect our spaces and our time from uh, for non-instrumental, non-commercial activity and thought, for maintenance, for care, for conviviality. And I'm suggesting that we fiercely protect our human animality against all technologies that actively ignore and disdain the body. So anyway, I'm I'm you know I'm with her on that. I think it is. It is a bad thing to obsess uh, over news cycles and to think that posting something on Facebook is tantamount to doing something because, look, a million people liked it instantly without even really reading it. And I agree with her. We do need distance and time to just be functional enough to do or say or think anything meaningful at all. And it's hard to have that time if we're obsessed with, with productivity. So anyway, I think she's setting the stage for, you know, her argument for why it's important to to unplug. But I really like the fact that she's she's not pitching this idea as just like a weekend retreat, you know, like, oh, let's take a Sabbath maybe from like, let's turn our phones off for an hour and just breathe. Um, I think it is kind of a self-help book, but it is going to be a little bit more activist-y, I think. Um, she talks, she has this concept called resisting in place. I'm not really sure what that means yet. Um, The quote is, uh, resisting in place is to make oneself into a shape that cannot so easily be appropriated by the capitalist value system. So again, I'm interested in what shapes those are. Um, And I'm definitely going to keep reading. Um, One question I'll I'll leave you guys with, um, if you're interested in responding in in any way, shape, or form, is uh, there's page... Uh, XI, which is going to be, I guess, 11 in the introduction, where she says, life is more than an instrument. She put that more than an instrument in in italics. Life is more than an instrument and therefore something that cannot be optimized. And I'm curious what you guys think about that, because I, um, I don't know. It's nice to think of life as just like irreducibly organic and therefore um, should be completely self-directed and stuff. Um, but I, you know, I, I do believe in optimization wherever possible at the same time, goal setting and, um, 
I'm not going to um, resist efficiency just for the sake of resisting efficiency. I mean, if efficiency in and of itself is um, is a good concept. Um, so anyway, thanks for uh, listening. And if you're reading the book, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am and finding it thought provoking. And um, I'd love to hear your 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 own thoughts on the book. In any any responses to that you may have had to the parts that stuck out to me. Thanks and uh, wash your hands.